Hello, my name is Roman Murin, and I'm going to talk to you about radiation, light, heat, and power density. I've had a lot of difficult questions over the last year on Facebook, and sometimes it's not easy to explain them um, and just writing the answer down. Sometimes you need charts and graphs and things. So uh, this video is all about providing some answers to some of those difficult questions. There's four or five stages in this talk. I'll be talking about what the sun delivers as energy, because that's really the basis of our reason to try and replicate it. Why a tungsten lamp, a tungsten incandescent lamp, is a vehicle, a, a tool that will be good for using um, in a vivarium. I'll s try and describe what a tungsten lamp actually is, because there's some confusion in the, in, the, uh, in the Facebooks, actually what it is and how the filaments work and how the focusing works. I'll describe what happens when you dim it and I'll talk a little bit about the heat and the light that it produces and how it's managed by the lamp at different wavelengths. So, moving on to what the sun radiates. It radiates, it emits, because the sun is a black body, which meets particular physical parameters um, and this black body, the Sun, radiates photons. Those photons come in different energy levels and different wavelengths. They get radiated um, from the Sun and have to travel to us on Earth through the atmosphere. The atmosphere blocks the wavelengths according to their wavelength. So some wavelengths get through the atmosphere and some don't. On this slide, the total radiation from the sun and the peak is at the peak with the, uh, the yellow on the left hand side of the graph. Um, the peak is about 5,500 degrees Kelvin. And as the temperature drops, so the energy from the photons reduces as well. You can see on the graph that there are notches in what we receive on Earth. And what we receive on Earth is a coloured bit. Those notches are due to, for instance, CO2 or water molecules. And those water molecules block the photons at particular wavelengths. On, on, the, um, on the bottom line, the uh, dimensions are wavelength in nanometers. And you can see that the visible light where the rainbow is is what we humans have developed to be able to see. What we don't see is the ultraviolet on the left and the infrared on the right. Nevertheless, those wavelengths still reach Earth. The pie, the pie chart that you can see represents the proportions of light from sunlight. So the green, which represents the visible light, of all the sunlight that is delivered, 43% of that light we can actually see, the rest we can't. The next important bunch of light is infrared A, which is the pink lot. And now we use some of that light for our own biological purposes uh, in, in terms of s cellular use, but also the remaining light we use for warmth. Uh, difficult sometimes to grasp what wavelength is, so I've tried to represent it in another way. What I've done is I've taken those wavelengths and uh, measured them and represented them as bars. Now imagine this if this was a piano. On the left hand side you've got the high pitched keys, which is the higher temperature ones, higher temperature wavelengths equating to high pitched keys on the piano. And incidentally, they're also shorter wavelength, as is the strings on the piano. So these high-pitched, high-pitched, higher Kelvin temperatures, shorter wavelengths are on the left. And just as you get on the piano, as you go to the right, so you get the longer wavelengths and you get the longer piano strings that go behind the keys. The total power that we receive from the sun is 
the addition of all the powers of the individual wavelengths. So these numbers on the left, on the vertical left, represent the power. And if you add them all up, they will come up to about a kilowatt of power reaching the Earth. And you can see on the graph that the visible light produces some 43%, and the infrared is about 41%. What I did was I, I went out on the height of the summer with a meter that can measure infrared and a meter that can measure, measure lux and a meter that can measure UV and I measured them and over the course of the day I plotted what the readings were. I wish I'd got up earlier because the day was lovely, perfect for doing this measurement. And it would have been good to measure all the stuff on the left, starting at five o'clock in the morning. I didn't. But assume that the left reflects what we see on the right. So the first thing that we see, which is the red line, is the infrared light coming through, just as you'd see in the, uh, in the pictures. Last thing at night, first thing in the morning, what you do is you see the red light. And then as the day moves on in the morning, the visible light, more visible light starts coming through. And then finally at midday or nearer the midday, more UV comes through as the sun has a shorter distance to travel through the atmosphere. What I've done also is I've plotted the temperature of the basking spot. I've also said where the animals have stopped basking. And you can see that um, the animals started basking really early in the morning where the power density and the, the blue and the red line really reflect the power of the light. Where the power of the light was lower than it was at midday, <coughs> it was probably about half. But they were basking in it and they were absorbing the energy from the light. If you had looked at the temperature of the basking spot at 10.30, you'd have seen that the basking spot was below 20 degrees centigrade, and yet they were basking. As the day progressed at 11.5, 11.30, the basking strength of the light had reached or reaching its peak and they had reached temperature and the animals had stopped basking they disappeared but the basking spot continued to increase in temperature until at 16.5 which is 4.30 the animals came out to bask again and if you would have taken the temperature of the basking spot you'd have seen it was about 42 which it says on the yellow line so the point at which they were basking is not a good indicator of the quality of light that they need for basking. And they came out as the light was starting to get um, less, as the sunshine was becoming less powerful. And you can see then as it was dropping, then later on, at 17.5, 5.30, they actually started nesting. The message here is, Measuring basking spot temperature is not a good indication of whether the light that you're using is appropriate. Here you can see um, the summation of uh, the bars of the power at midday. So this is 430 watts for visible light and 410 watts for infrared. What I'm saying is that the power that you want for your lamps, your power density for the lamps, should be between 200 and 300, somewhat less than this, which you've got at midday. Now, th this, this is really, this was just really interesting to find, because I've been testing these lamps for three years, and what I concluded, what I ended up with, was a halide lamp working with a tungsten halogen lamp 
on a single spotlight to produce a basking spot which the animals really liked. Same goes for the LED LED. And when I measured the combined power density of those two lights, which the animals consistently liked, the power density I was getting was 290 and 300. Well, that stacks up with what um, I've been measuring with sunlight. Story doesn't stop here, though. In papers that I've been reading, for example, a paper by Barillet, which is reflected the details are at the bottom of the page. He says in that paper that the solar IRA average radiance is around 200 milliwatts per centimetre. Now, the units are slightly different. If you convert them to watts per metre squared, it comes out 200 watts. It's the same figure that he's come up with. And what Barrett is also saying, and in the graph you can see, that in the morning and he's looking from 6.30 to 9.30, there is more infrared in sunlight than we normally say, because we're always quoting the sunlight curves at midday. It stacks up. So why a tungsten incandescent lamp? Why do we choose that? Well, the sun is a black body. It radiates according to Stefan Boltzmann's laws of physics. But then, so is a tungsten halogen lamp. The coil, the filament inside the lamp, is the black body. And it too conforms to the Stefan Boltzmann's laws of physics. In that diagram that we have from the Zeiss website, they offer us a number of um, tungsten halogen spectral distribution curves and they start off 3000 K, 33000 K and they work down. And you'll see that as the colour temperature drops down, so the area under the curve reduces. And that really means that the power under the curve reduces. Any lamp that produces light through heating, through incandescence, is a black body lamp. Tungsten halogen are one example, but so is a carbon-based heat projector, and so is a ceramic heat emitter. It's ceramic heat emitter. Both produce and radiate as a result of heat. Let me introduce you, stage right at the bottom, a website from Dr. Serena Wunderlich. Serena has produced a, a really good website, and in that website she has taken the Stefan Boltzmann's laws, and they're a, a standard thing, and she's produced an easy to use spreadsheet where you uh, type in the value of the, uh, the Kelvin value of your lamp and it will give you a curve to represent the radiation that the lamp produces. So the top left hand corner, um, the lamp that uh, we're going to be talking about over and over again, is a 50 watt 2000 K tungsten halogen lamp. And if you type in the values for that lamp, you get a curve of this nature, which is the orange curve. Typical black body filament curve. The filament is the black body, and that's, give or take a bit of physics and a bit of engineering, that's the shape of the radiation from that lamp. We put it inside a glass envelope, the bulb, and the glass itself has an attenuation factor. And that attenuation factor is that dotted line on the graph on the right. Or the other locus that you see there, um, the attenuation factors for different kinds of glass. But the dotted line is the glass that we're interested in for the purposes of making lamps. You can see that between 0.3 microns or 300 nanometers and 
2 microns or 2000 nanometers, that the glass attenuates the, the, uh, the signal, the light, by, by some 10%. It, it only passes 90% of the light. What I've done is I've taken this curve and muddled it up with Serena's spreadsheet and got the uh, curve at the bottom left hand side where the original radiation is the orange curve and the blue curve is the one that results from uh, factoring in the attenuation of the glass. You can see the, the radiation from the glass is now much lower. The difference between the two curves is what is trapped inside the lamp. And that heats the lamp. It makes the lamp hot. You can see this little, the kink at 2300, which is the same kink you see in the attenuation of the glass on the graph on the right. Now what I've done is I've taken that blue curve and I've wrapped it up to represent a lamp power of 200 watts per metre and I've superimposed it on sunlight. I've determined that 200 watts per metre is a good number for a lamp power and blimey look, look how well it sits over sunlight. At the back end of IRA with this IRB, uh, there's no IRC, but the IREB and the back of IRA, the curve is excellent. It's why we choose it. So now, now we know why the curve is important and that the radiation from the lamp is important. Let's have a look what actually is a tungsten lamp. We talk about heat uh, as jargon in our English language. We talk about white hot and we talk about red hot. We know the white hot is hotter than red hot. We just know, don't we? Well, that's jargon that translates into lamp temperatures. The hotter a lamp filament gets, the more light it produces and the whiter it gets. Here we see a number of bulbs. All of them are tungsten halogen lamps. On the far right is a PAR38, and on the far left is an, one of the really early uh, lamps with a tungsten filament um, with a tungsten filament that wasn't very bright for its wattage. And number one is one of those. Then you can see that the power comes in from the contactors along the two prods which support the filament. And that filament is a single filament. And it heats up because of the electricity and it produces light. There's some gas in there as well. To, to, to help support the efficiency of the filament. But that's it, that's the original lamp. And that, and that was called an incandescent lamp because it was simply getting white hot and, and the light that we got from it was what we used. We got more so sophisticated in design of filaments and in, the, in number two, you can see the filament has now got coils in it. And those coils make the, the filament longer, a lot longer. Therefore, you can apply uh, perhaps more power to it, but also it's got more surface area. Remember that the radiation is proportional to the surface area as well as the temperature. So now you've got more, ser more surface area on the filament, and then you're producing more you've got more surface area to, to radiate the photons. In three, there's a big jump in technology. Well, what's been done here is that the filament has been put into a smaller capsule. And that capsule is made of glass that is more efficient. It transmits more of the energy. It passes more of the energy. And on top of that, there's been a gas inserted in it. A halogen gas. So this is now a tungsten element with a halogen gas. So it's a tungsten halogen lamp. It's under pressure. So now this same glass can also manage higher temperatures. So now 
we can run it at higher temperature, produce more light for the same filament size. It's also smaller. And because of the way it's done, you can produce this using this method by the millions. It's reliable and it's small. And you can use this inside other lamps. Finally, that's evolved to what we've got in five, which is a very small lamp. And look at the filament. It's a tight, neat little so-and-so, isn't it? Produces masses of light. It's compact and it's really efficient. These little capsules are now are used within the lamp. And these lamps come in different sizes. Par, 50, par 30s, par 20s, par 38s. But the same capsule, if you look, is in all of them. So you can produce a capsule independent of the glass lamp around it. The par 38, the par 20 value, has nothing to do with the quality of the filament inside it. It's just a dimension, a physical dimension, used for the installation of the lamp. <coughs> Here's a collection in this slide of the lamps that are available. The manufacturers can fit in some of these lamps. For instance, the, the middle row on the right, you've got par 38s. These par 38s might have a filament, an incandescent filament in them, or they might have a capsule. You don't know by looking. And I have lamps that are par 38s that have both. And depending where the filament is, the focus point and the nature of the beam will change. On the par 20s to the left, you'll see there's two par one with a long net and one with a short net. Depending where you put the capsule will change the focus point, will change the nature of the beam. One cannot say by looking at the diameter of the lamp what kind of beam it will be. I have to be quite clear on this. A lot of punters out here are saying that it's a par 38, it'll be this sort of beam, and it's a par 20, it'll be this sort of beam. You can't really tell. What you can say is, is that if it's an incandescent filament, and sometimes you can see the filament, that because it's such a big area, you can't focus it. And you then, in those instances, you might get rings, or you may get shadows, but you'll only get that you're likely to get that more often with the big filament than you will with the little capsule. Okay, so what happens when you dim the lamp? Well, we know now from this curve here that as the colour temperature drops, so the area under the curve for that colour temperature reduces, which is exactly what you want. As you dim it, you want less power. Before we develop this discussion, let's talk about how you might want to dim it. And there are principally two ways that you can do that, two modern ways. The top three graphs are for a dimming system where phase is used. The first set of curves are sine waves, the voltage sine waves go into the lamp. And as you apply dimming, the reduction of voltage to the lamp, what a face cut dimmer does, it takes out a chunk of the waveform, which you can see, and it takes it out on the positive curve, and it takes it out on the negative curve. So that both positive and negative curves now, how, now apply less voltage to the lamp. The proportional controller senses how much power is needed to increase the temperature of the lamp or decrease the temperature of the lamp depending on the setting. And so if the lamp is too hot and it wants to decrease the temperature of the lamp, it will apply more phase cut and you'll get what's on the right hand side. 
the area under the sine wave becomes less. And this, this works backwards and forwards, but the point is that the lamp is operated every cycle of the voltage cycle coming from the mains. The other system of control is pulse proportional and this is used in the house domestically a lot where a lamp isn't involved but a big fat heater is and this is called pulse proportional control where the controller has a duty cycle and in this case it's about 1.4 seconds and every 1.4 seconds it measures what the temperature should be and what the temperature is and it applies a duty cycle over that period of more or less power to the heater and in, the, in this instance it looks like there's about 20 percent power going in the duty cycle of 1.4 seconds now if it's too cold or too cool the controller will apply more power and increase the duty cycle and you can see on the right the duty cycle has been increased to about 50 percent of the 1.4 seconds and if it's still too cold it'll turn it on completely so that power is on all the time and then as it warms up it'll back it off this is a really effective way of controlling heater elements that have got long time constants and don't cool down between being turned on and turned off but if you operate a tungsten halogen lamp on one of these it'll flash which is a pain in the eyes i can assure you but it also every one of these duty cycles is taken life out of your lamp because lamps are taken by the number of operations they will endure and if you've got a lamp that's got say a hundred thousand cycles well each one of these is one a cycle and each one of these will take out part of the life of your light, part of the life of your lamp. I'll show this a different way. Back to this lovely curves. Um, you can see from the, say if you take the blue one, the dark blue one, which is 3000K, you will see that curve has, going from red to the left, quite a good amount of visible light um, being produced. And that's reflected by 8% of the tungsten halogen pie chart. Then as the temperature drops, so the proportion of light compared to the radiation on the right of that light, that visible light decreases. And you can see that in the pie charts going from 2000 to 2700 to 2300. The proportion of visible light decreases. Until you get to the point of the carbon filament lamp, where this is telling me there's no visible light. Actually, we know if we look at a carbon filament heat projector, you can just see it just glowing tiny red. Well, that's less than 1% of the power of the lamp, and therefore it's not registered on this pie chart. Finally, we look at the heat projector at 600K, produces no light whatsoever. I've looked at these, looking at this thing a different way now. I've got a reference point of power coming from a lamp that's 3000K. And I thought, well, what's the color temperature of a lamp at half the power? And I've set that lamp and it happens to be that a 2500K lamp produces 3% light, but it's now at half power of the 3000 lamp. So a small reduction in colour temperature reduces the power by a half. Now I repeated this for a whole lot of values so that if you wanted to you could look at the curves um, later on as you're running the video. So this is 2900 and you can see the bar on the right is a power from the uh, the the, uh, t the test value, and the, the orange light is the reference value, and the the, um, 
the little block at the top gives you the ratio of one against the other. And you can see that as I'm dropping the temperature to 2600, the ratio quickly increases. Till at 2000, where you've dropped the Kelvin value by 1 to 3, you've dropped the power that it produces by 1 to 5. Then you drop it to 1000K, and now all of a sudden you've got a ratio of 82 to 1, compared to a 3000K lamps. At 800K, which is the heat projector uh, colour temperature-ish, you've got a ratio of 200 to 1. And that means that per square metre, the, the black body um, physics rule, because that's how we measure the, the, uh, the values, the ratio per square metre compared to a 3000K lamp is 200 to 1. I've taken that curve that was a flat line, I've increased it by 200, and that's what it looks like. It still looks like a black body curve. Now I've gone to a ceramic heat emitter, and the ratio has gone up by 660 to 1. And that ratio again is radiation. The amount of photons produced per square metre. And so to summarise, because it's quite an important point, that as you reduce the Kelvin value, you reduce the radiation from the black body per square metre. The 800K radiation from a ceramic heat emitter is 660 times lower than the radiation you get from a tungsten halogen lamp. So... I've just told you guys that as the colour temperature drops, as the black body temperature of the emitting body drops, so the radiation drops like a stone. It really reduces very quickly. However, if you've got a ceramic heat emitter, or if you've got a carbon filter filament heat projector, you put your hand on it there, you can feel the heat from it. Well, how come you can feel the heat from it? That's a question that's been asked of me. Um, and I've not been, ex be able, been able to explain it very well without doing some preparation. And so let me have a go at explaining why that's the case. We, when we looked at the, um, the pictures of early filaments, the incandescent filaments, we could see that they were fairly crude. You could see that they were two rods, metal rods, with a filament strung between them, and that filament got hot. This top right-hand picture shows a filament, a bit fancier, it's got coils in it, and those coils enable the filament to be longer. And so for a given resistance, you can actually put a bit more power through it, and therefore it would produce more photons. And if you had the right equipment and magnified it really well, you could work out that there were about 90 coils. You could work out what the diameter of each coil was, and you could probably work out that the distance, the length of this filament, was 2.3 meters. And if you look really closely, you could work out what the diameter of the coil, the uh, filament was. And if you know the diameter, you know its circumference. And if you know the circumference and you know how long it is, you can work out the surface area, which is what I've done. And that's about 9.8 times 10 to the minus 4 meters, or nearly 10 to the minus 3 meters squared. So, I did the same thing for this fancy modern lamp here and I could, using scales and photographing close-up and counting, 
work out what the surface area of this little fella was. And again, it's the same thing as the one above, but it's just a fancy bit of kit. You can see the two wires feeding the filament and all the power going into the filament. That's the black body. And I worked out there's a surface area of it. It's 5.6 times 10 to the minus 5 square metres. And all of that surface is emitting. The difference in area is about 17.5 times. This is that much smaller than the other one. Let's look at another example. This is a carbon heat emitter. And we're ignoring the fact that the carbon filament is a number of strands. We're ignoring a, a, a whole load of bits of physics, just working out what the proportion of the area is, give or take. And we can work out it's 1.2 metres long. And we can work out its surface area. <coughs> and we can work out that it's 640 times the area of the little bulb. So now we're getting a pattern. The cooler it gets, the, the lower the Kelvin temperature it gets, the bigger the surface area has to be to come up with the radiation levels that you get with the higher temperature bulbs. And that's what's happening. We can go to the extreme, we can go to the ceramic heat emitters now, where you can physically measure the temperature of the lamp with a laser um, thermometer. And I made it, on average, about 600 Kelvin. When you push that into the, um, into the, into the uh, spreadsheet, you get this, the, the image that you've got in the bottom left, bottom right, with 4% infrared and the rest is infrared C. And you get a ratio of 660 to 1 in terms of power per square metre compared to the little tungsten halogen lamp. So what does the surface area do? If, if you then work out the surface area of this, which I've done, and it's 1.9 times 10 to the minus 2 square metres, the ratio of area is 339 to 1. So this is so much bigger in surface area to the little lamp. But it's still not producing the amount of radiation that you might expect, because the radiation is 662 times. So what they've had to do is actually increase the power going into the lamp to bring up the radiation. And in fact, most of the heat is not lost through radiation. Most of the heat is lost through uh, conduction and convection. And that's why the holder above it is still hot and it's at 120 degrees. It's nearly the same temperature as the, uh, the lamp itself. And that's where it's losing, uh, that's where it's dissipating the heat, this excess to the radiation. Now we're not done yet, because I've had questions asked, well, what does a tungsten halogen lamp do? Because it gets hot. You recall the graph earlier where I plotted what radiation came from the black body filament and what radiation was blocked by the glass. And it's the difference between these two lines that is the power that's kept inside the glass. Well, you can go out and measure it. You can measure it with a, um, an infrared gun, which is what I've done. And the hottest temperature I found on the lamp was 104 degrees. At 144 degrees, if you put that into the black body calculator, you get a ratio of 5,200 to 1 against the light that is coming out from the front of it. I'll say that again. 
This lamp produces light that comes out the front of it. And that's got a high energy level. All of its energy, or most of its energy, comes out as photons. This bit, which is infrared C energy, is radiated out the back. And the ratio of the energy from this compared to the energy from the carried by the photons is 5,200 to 1. It's 14 times less than the ceramic heat emitter. So my contention to you folks is that the secondary re-radiation of a tungsten halogen lamp can be ignored. It does get warm and it'll warm up the room. It'll warm up the vivarium because there's still some heat. And if this was 5 or 10% heat in a 100 watt lamp, that's still 7 or 8 watts and that'll heat up your vivarium. I hope that puts that one to bed. So, let's conclude. The values that we've been using for sunlight strength are based on sunlight measured at midday, when the sun is the strongest. We should consider using lower power densities of radiation, powers associated with mid-morning sunlight. Let's make it half or two-thirds of what we see at midday. Tanks and halogen lamps are just perfect because they are black bodies. The radiation at the back end of the curve follows the sunlight curve. The dimming of tanks and halogen lamps doesn't materially affect the wavelengths produced by the lamps. It's a natural dimming that um, not really have an effect on the quality of the light that comes from them. The carbon filament heat projectors and ceramic heat emitters do radiate infrared, but the component of radiation cons little, contains little infrared B and is mostly thermal infrared C. It doesn't really reflect sunlight but it does produce radiation that will warm up bodies. A tungsten halogen lamp does radiate some IRC due to the heat trapped in the lamp, but it can be ignored as a factor in vivarium husbandry. I hope you've enjoyed this talk. <laughs>